Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new version of Relationship Marketing with Cody B. I'm really excited for our show today. Uh, it's been really fun to start doing these and uh, to be able to interview some of our uh, great uh, thought leaders that are out there in the world of sales and marketing and relationships and personal development and all of these wonderful things that we should be feeding ourselves all the time. That's why I love the podcast format so that you know, I love to download podcasts myself and listen to them as I drive. Hopefully you're doing the same thing and hopefully we can provide some content that's useful for you in your professional careers. We have an incredible guest today to help us do that and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, read a little bit about this guy because you really need to kind of know a little bit about who you're listening to today. I had the great opportunity to be on the same speaking format with our guest today. Uh, we were at the Professional Business Connection Summit here a couple months ago in Salt Lake City, and we, we both spoke. Uh, he spoke right before I did, so it was great. And I actually just absolutely loved this guy's presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce you to James Muir. He's the speaker, author, and CEO. Uh, he's the CEO of Best Practice International. He lives in the mountains of Salt Lake City, Utah, so he actually lives close to where my wife and I do, our family. Uh, he is the best-selling author, author of The Perfect Close. Those of you that see us on YouTube, I'm going to put this up here. I, I, it's, it's real close up there of The Perfect Close book, which is a phenomenal book. And uh, so he is the author of The Perfect Close, 30-year veteran of sales, having served in every role from individual contributor to executive vice president. His mission is to make the complex simple. So what I'm saying here is that he is a done there, been there, done that guy. He's not just a, a, a self-proclaimed trainer. He's been in the world of sales. He's uh, broken records in the world of sales, done some incredible things, and then wants to share what he's learned with other people. So we're excited for that. He has an extensive background in healthcare where he has sold to and spoken for the largest names in technology and healthcare, including HCA, uh, Tenet, Catholic Healthcare, Banner, Dell, IBM, and others. So not only is James a lifelong student of cells, he's also an accomplished guitarist, organic chemistry fan, and fits the <laughs> band. We got a lot to talk about here today. James Moore, welcome to Relationship Marketing with Cody B. Cody, it's great to be together again. <laughs> yes, it sure is. And uh, like I said, when we spoke at that event, it was just a lot of fun. You, you, I, I love listening to speakers who are, are able to give you impact instantly. And you're, you, you were able to give impact instantly. In fact, this book gives impact instantly because you have a very simple concept. And, you know, we're, it's called The Perfect Close. So there's emphasis in this book here about, you know, closing in sales, which is a very important part of the sales process, of course. But you have a very simple in fact, it's kind of like a two-sentence thing that is your philosophy, and then you built an entire book around it. Tell us, what is the perfect close? Well, uh, it's, it's it, the, the, actually the, the origins of the perfect close is just because of me, myself, I'm an accidental salesperson. So when I got into it, I actually didn't know how to move my deals forward. I was a technical person that got thrust into a sort of an operations, but also a sales position when we opened up a new office in Salt Lake City. And um, I didn't know what to do. So I, what I tended to do is I just overpresented. I would just keep going and going and going until the customer would stop me and say, hey, are we going to do something or what? <laughs> and I would, I would reflect, like, why, why, why was I doing that? Why would I, you know, so um, ultimately, I never did find a book. I've got, there's hundreds of books out there on closing, and I have almost all of them. And, and almost probably 99% of them are all manipulative. And, they, and, and the reason people don't use them is because, it feels bad when you're trying to use them. They don't want to ruin the relationship. So in, in essence, they don't do anything. It's what statistically happens is people don't do anything. Instead of asking for an advance of some kind or they're moving the sale forward, they just don't do anything because they don't know what to say that it, it doesn't feel slimy. So the two questions are, are pretty, pretty cut and dried, right? We've, we've boiled it down to something very simple. There's actually five variations of, of the perfect close, but the, the, the most simplest version is where the, you, the first question is, does it make sense for us to do X, right? And where the X is whatever you want the advance to be. 
right? So if let's just say we're consultants and we need to do an assessment before you know, we propose, we might say, hey, does it make sense for us to you know, do an assessment you know, to see where our best options are? And in that case, the assessment would be the X, right? And so when you think about it, the question, does it make sense to X? There's only two things they can say, right? They can either say yes or they can say no. If they say yes, great. You don't even need to use the second question. You just got your advance. Uh, the, uh, and then if they say no, they're just going to use the, the second question. The second question is some variation of, well, all right, well, what do you think is a good next step then? And what I can tell you, having done hundreds of ride longs, is that in 90% of cases, the customer will just suggest a very natural next step for where they're comfortable at in their process. And so you end up either with an advance or you end up with some suggestion from the client that also advances the sale in every case. So, uh, and the best part is that we're just timing it at the pace that the customer is ready to go for. It's when we start asking them to do stuff that's, that they're not comfortable with, right? That they're not ready for, that's when it starts to feel like pressure to them and that's when it will emotionally backfire on us. So anyway, that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. There is certainly quite a bit more to it than that, but that is the kindergarten version of the, of the perfect close. I actually like how you start the book. You start saying, all right, for all of you that want to cut to the chase, you can go straight to page 178 and the perfect close is there. But there's a whole, there, you know, there's a whole book around this teaching, you know, fundamentals of closing that all tie. It's beautifully done. Your book, book is beautifully done because all of your buildups and all of your stories and all of everything you teach, all your principles build up to or or you know are pointed to the perfect close itself which are those two sentences here's what i love about it i have the book out called the power of human connection and and this is how relationship marketing there you go yeah there you go how relationship marketing is transforming the way people succeed now in this book i i talk a lot about relation the the relationship marketing sales process and in the relationship marketing sales process, we talk about the fact that relationship is the most important thing, not the marketing. And most salespeople, you know, traditional sales is, like you said, traditional sales is I'm going to prospect to get a person that might buy my product. Once I have that person, I'm going to present to them to get them to buy from me. And if they don't want to buy from me, like you said, I'm going to manipulate the clothes until I guilt them into or whatever, buy from me. But by golly, I'm going to get the clothes. That is the traditional sales process. To you and I, it makes no sense to be in that world anymore. But the reality is a lot of salespeople are still in that world. So we have a job to do to teach this concept of relationship rate, not relate, not only is relationship come first, relationship really is the only thing there is. So you may or may not get a sell, but you will, uh, you will create a relationship. And if you create a relationship, you're either going to create a sell from it, or you're going to create a referral from it. But either way, relationship is more powerful than a closed sell and and that's that's a hard sell on a lot of traditional salespeople. Now, the reason I bring all of that up is because that's why I resonated so much with the perfect close. Because you know, you, you talk a lot in your book about establishing rapport and about assessing need versus giving presentation. Talk to us about that. What what what's the difference and why is that so important especially today? Oh, well, I would just sum it up in saying that prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Right. That, that's the shortest way you can say it, which is if you went into a doctor and before the doctor ever did any kind of exam on you, he said, well, I got some drugs here and I'm sure this is exactly the thing that you need. You would very much question the validity of that doctor and whatever assessment that they're making. So, um, but salespeople do that all the time. And the reason that they do it is because they know that there's only one thing in their little pouch of stuff to sell. And so they're walking in there going, that's the thing I'm going to sell. And so they don't slow down enough to just understand the customer and figure out what they're trying to do. And if you do that, once you, it's about being um, actually trying to serve and help the customer. And so you need to go into the, 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 the encounter um, with the customer, tabula rasa, you, a blank slate. You might get something out of this. You might not get anything out of this, right? You might, uh, you, you might be able to refer them to someone else. It's a better match for them. So we just go into it seeing how we can serve them. 
And what I can tell you, and, and just to add a little juice, there was so much in what you just said that was so good there, is um, that when people first encounter another human being, there, there's two things that they measure. They measure warmth and they measure competency. And uh, what you just tapped into there is that the standard selling world all tries to focus on the very macho competency. I am the best at solving this problem is what they want to do. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. In these initial um, interactions with people, people weigh warmth um, more and higher than competency. Okay. And, uh, and so it would be, so if you're very competent, but they don't like you or they don't trust you, then they're not going to do business with you. That's the really short version of the whole, all the science around that. And so it's really important that when we come into it, that we just come in with the genuine intent to serve. And when they detect that, they will become, they'll be open and forthcoming and that'll help us serve them. What, what happens is if we come in all macho gung ho that we can, we can solve the problem best, but they sense that you're, you're self motivated, that you're going for what's in it for you. What they tend to do is they withhold information because they're worried that that's going to be used against them as the sales process continues. And that creates a very dysfunctional environment for buying. It, it's, we need to actually understand what's going on with them if we can help them. And so the, the, the thing, you know, you can boil all that down to a very simple thing. And that is just actually care about what is happening with the customer. Get off yourself, get off the solution long enough just to understand what's there. And if there's a opportunity there, it will present itself. But it, it's more important that we demonstrate warmth and a genuine intent to serve than our competency. And that's a fact. Um, there's plenty of science around that. But if we, if we go into a situation, even if you are the most competent to solve a problem, if you don't demonstrate warmth, the customer will reject you. And so very often people get scratched their head like, gosh, I can't believe it. We have the best solution, but, but they didn't pick us. Why did that happen? And that's because you failed the warmth competent. You failed the warmth part of that formula. So it's serving, not selling. Serving, that's it. Not selling. I mean, and, and again, I would say that when you're ser when you're selling correctly, selling is serving. Selling is serving. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's exactly right. That's why it's one of the most no. It's actually should be one of the most noble professions, not a profession that's looked down upon by a lot of people. And if sales is done right, if sales is done in the name of service, then it's a very noble. Because again, that's that's that is what you're doing. You're you're there to assess, serve, help, be genuine with people. Now, here's what I get a lot from that. You know, we when when I start talking about the process, and you do it too. You t you talk talk about the process of creating relationship as you go, assess people's needs, ask lots of questions, go through all the process. Then once that assessment, you know, feels that you get to a good point, I love the perfect close is, does it, you know, now that we've done this, does it make sense to, and it's usually not, does it make sense to buy? You usually start with, does it make sense to do another thing that would get them closer to buying? A small step. So talk about the small step versus going in for the kill. So it's an interesting fact is if you ask the average salesperson, hey, what do you hope is going to happen as the outcome of your meeting today? Like seriously, like 80 some percent of them will tell you to close, even right. though statistically and Neil Rackham, by the way, uh, who's uh, sort of the patron saint of scientific selling back in the 80s did the, mo the, the biggest study ever done on face to face sales encounters. And what he discovered is that in reality, only one out of 10 sales encounters actually ends in either a sale or a no sale. What happens in the other nine is the sale either moves forward in a little way or something happens, which is called a continuation, which is the sale actually doesn't progress in any way, but it doesn't actually get lost either. And so it just kind of languishes. It just continues. And he called that a continuation. And so it, that's the kind of the key is you know, of using the perfect close is, well, what are the little steps that add up to the final big step? There's a lot of little steps that get us to the yeah. final step. It's when we try to pace it too fast, that starts to feel manipulative to the customer. So it's, it's, it makes sense to take a little bit of thought and say, okay, what are the little things that my customer needs to do between now and when they finally make the decision and just help facilitate their way through that. And the way I like to turn that paradigm for salespeople um, or even professionals, entrepreneurs, you know, they all kind of some, some people they struggle with this. It's just, you're a coach that you wouldn't even be talking to this person if they weren't trying to get, improve themselves in some way. And, and which one of us would not like to have a coach would help us with our, you know, our professional or our physical goals. 
to help us move forward at the pace we're ready for. Well, that's what you are, right? You're just trying to help them do that. So right. at the right time, you, we just want to ask a facilitative question. Okay, well, you know, I think the, you know, most people at this stage do this thing. Does it make sense for us to do that thing? And then we're going to listen to their answer. If they say yes, then it means it's time is right. If they say no, then we're going to, you know, we're going to ask them, all right, well, what, what are you ready for right now? Basically, that's what it boils down to. Excellent. You know, and, and I, I want to go back to, I was leading up to another question when we, when we sidetracked onto this question, which I just loved your answer. This process that you're talking about, you know, it's a process. Assessment is a process. Serving is a process. Even the perfect close is a process. It's, it's not, it's not going into the immediate. It's, does it make sense to do something else that can serve you? And it's a step-by-step -step approach. So here's what I get a lot. What I get a lot from salespeople is, you know, this all sounds great guys, but man, that takes so much time. You know, I got, <laughs> I got bills to pay. I got to make some sales. I got to get some commissions done. And, and what, what you're saying sounds great, but man, it's going to take me forever to get from the prospecting stage all the way to an actual close where I can cash a check somewhere. So how do you, how do you respond to that? How, what, what, what do you advise someone that has that objection? Oh my gosh. I, I just say it this way. Fat or uh, slow is fast. And I know that that does just seems totally counterintuitive, but uh, like, it's like I said before, if when we try to move it faster than they're ready for, that's when they push back. And then you've really turned on the brakes for how fast your deal is going to go. So it is very counterintuitive. In fact, one thing that you said at the beginning is all the typical transit, you know, approach that everybody takes. And because they're coming in at it with this macho accelerate the sale, I'm going to manipulate this person. And they're, they're actually, the data is out. I mean, it's been super really well studied. And um, that approach actually is counterproductive. You will sell less. You will sell less by using that approach. And so, and the reason for that is just because people, if they don't trust you, uh, they weight the warmth factor more heavily in sales than any other kind of interaction. And the reason for that is because they know that the salesperson knows more about the solution than they do. And so they're, they're at a disadvantage. So they, they have to trust the person that they're working with in order to you know, be successful. They're operating on, uh, on faith. And so, so if, go ahead, sorry. So isn't the key to like, like I, I think the temptation for people to move fast is when they don't have enough people to talk to. So if, if your pipeline is weak, if there's not a lot of people in the pipeline, you, Nat, um, as good as you are, you will naturally have the temptation to try to go for a close because Absolutely. you just don't have enough people to talk to. So, and, and this comes up literally, this comes up on almost every podcast I have. The pipeline always comes up, and the importance of lots of people in the pipeline always comes up because the more people you have in there, the more you can serve them the right way. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Oh, my goodness. So, um, there's four high leverage areas for sales prospecting, and, and those are market message, medium, and motivation. Those four are the highest leverage things that you can work on. And so the market piece is, is basically making sure that you're only talking to the people that are the most qualified or the, most, the highest prospect, uh, highest probability for the thing that you sell. But, um, but just to kind of boil it down is uh, if you don't have a strong pipeline, then you get desperate. And that, by the way, is not unique to small business or medium business. I've seen gigantic corporations that get into this scenario where their pipeline is weak. And so they, it, they try to use very dysfunctional tactics to try to accelerate the sale. And the most common is just discounting. They think, hey, and so think about what's happening here. If you and I don't trust each other, do you think it's going to make a lick of difference if I offer to give you what I'm selling for less? That's not the problem. You're trying to solve the problem at the wrong place when you do a tactic like that. And there's a bunch of other ones like scarcity, you know, all these different tactics that are manipulative. When the real problem is, is that you, A, you don't have a big enough pipeline and B, probably the trust level isn't there. They're not comfortable with the solution yet enough to move forward. So the key is just to try to attack it at that level. And, and that's where the discipline comes in is um, a, a lot of salespeople 
they work a deal until it's closed and then suddenly they have no pipeline. So they spend the next quarter trying to build their pipeline. And so they get on this roller coaster that just goes up and down. One quarter they're doing great and the next quarter they're tanking and the next quarter they're doing great. And so if you wanna get off that roller coaster, the only way to do it is to, in a structured and disciplined way, is to prospect on a consistent basis. That's the only solution. And we so, recently had uh, Jeb Blount on as, as one of our guests who wrote the book Fanatical Prospecting. And of course, he, he talks a lot about that, you know, just time blocking time to prospect and always be prospecting, even when you're closing a lot of sales and you're doing a lot of follow up and you're doing a lot of other stuff. You always have to time block for prospecting. Otherwise, there comes that, like you said, there comes the ebb and the flow because there, there ends up being not enough people in there. So, so let talk, me throw, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go I ahead. was going to throw some gasoline on that because let me just tell you, this is from my personal experience as a sales professional. And just to put it in perspective, you know, when I was an individual contributor, the, the, they were offering accelerators and bonuses to people that would close six turnkeys a year. These are tend to be larger deals that I would sell. And I was doing 25 a year. Oh. Okay. So I just want to compare that a, a top performer was doing six and I was doing one every other week. So how do you get to that stage? And what this boils down to is the trust and the relationship that we started this conversation out with. It is that while I'm working with an existing client to try to help them, I would, you know, at some point during the conversation, they will always, at some point, they will try to ask you about the price and what the best deal. And they, here's what I would say to them. I'd say, you know what? As long as I'm in the black, I really don't need to make the maximum amount on this opportunity, right? I just need to make sure that we're making a profit. So what would help me the most is if you'll help me get another account later, like once we get this all installed and it's working, if you'd be willing to share your experience with somebody else, then I will get you the best deal I can possibly get you. And once they, and, and once you have said that, I would get this response from them. They go like, oh, thank you. Yeah. They didn't have to worry that they were, that they were getting the best deal. And, and at the same time, they would say, absolutely, I would love to share my experience. So right from the get-go, before they were even sold, they were already prepared to help me get the next account. And so I call it critical mass. Once you've done this for a little bit and you get the machine working, it's actually very hard to spend time doing prospecting because you've got your own client bases feeding you so many opportunities that you'll have hard time finding prospecting. And so it's the best is just to serve your clients as good as you can serve them and have them help you get other clients. That's the secret formula right there. So in my book, uh, Power of Human Connection, I talk a lot about creating genuine relationship through the process and making it about creating relationship. You've had lots of success in sales. And I already know that a lot of reason for that success is, is you learned along the way how to create, and I'm not just going to say relationship. You learned how to create genuine relationship with human beings. You were creating human connection with people through the process. And I think that I, I'm, well, I know that's one of the reasons that you were at 25 plus when these others were at six. So my, my question is, what kind of things did you do or do you do and that you teach others to do through the sales process to always be creating relationship? Just, just give us some of the main things you do. You know, um, I, I would just say this way. Almost every sales is an interesting profession in that you've got this very small set of people that tend to spectacularly outperform everybody else. Like you'll have a hundred sales guys and there'll be like five or six that are, that are selling as much as the entire other 90% combined. And you're like, how does that happen? How do you get this runaway successes like this? And what I can tell you is every sales professional I've ever spoken to Jeb, for example, is a friend. I know you had Larry on your show. He's a friend. They all have this moment in their lives where they realize that if they just help the customer accomplish their goal and get what they need, they'll get what they need, right? right. And, and so um, I would just say, uh, it, what, if you create a process where you can actually genuinely understand, connect with the customer, communicate to them and have them understand that you actually care. And by the way, there's lots of ways to do that. I personally think the highest touch, per, you know, being face-to-face -face is the best way that you can do that. But there are, there are limitations to that, right? We, don't, we can't always be together with a person face to face, but that's the highest touch best way because they can actually connect with your intent. Right. And, and there's a whole bunch of silent communication that takes place that um, 
only only is conveyed in these on these face-to-face -face connections and if your intent's bad sad, sad to say you're transmitting that to them and they pick up on that uh, on the other hand once you finally get it that you're actually trying to help them um, then they get that too and you can screw up lots of other places but as long as they understand that you're genuinely trying to help them they will let you, they'll keep coming back to you and giving you chances to swing at the plate so um, that it's it's easy to say but maybe harder to do because i remember there was a time in my life when i was trying to kill it right i was really trying to you know work hard and and make sure that i was getting all the sales but it was when i it was when i pulled back and just tried to help the customers out that's when i really started to accelerate to the point where all these guys all the my customers were my sales force they were helping me instead of me trying to close them. I don't know if that makes sense, Cody. Oh yeah, no question about it. Again, it comes back to service. It's that it's through the process you are, it's a lot of it's psychological, I think. You, you, at some point you have, to, you have to make a conscious shift in your mind. And it's a hard shift for a lot of salespeople to make. It's, you gotta make this shift in your mind that, listen, I'm here to create a relationship with another human being. And, That's what I'm here for. And I happen to, have a specialty in a certain product or service. So that might be a, a way that I can be of service to this human being, but I'm here to create a relationship with a human being. And if it makes sense that my product or service or expertise helps them, then great. And instead of the ultimate goal being the close. Bingo. And that's, and, and let me just amplify this because um, I worked with a client um, that actually turned out to be a, 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 not a deal for us. Okay. So I'm working with this client. Well, that client ended up referring to me a person at Banner Health Systems, which is uh, one of the largest health systems in the United States. And that, that deal that went nowhere because I was trying to help that person just genuinely get what they needed, right? Didn't involve us, right? They ended up working with somebody else because that was really a better solution for what they had. That person referred me to Banner Health Systems, and Banner Health Systems turned into a long-term client worth over $10 million to my organization. So um, that's exactly the kind of karma that you're talking about in your book, is that um, if you just go into every situation thinking, how can I help, right? You'll, you'll be doing the right thing. You'll be doing the right thing. And, and most of the time, that will probably turn into a, um, a solution for you. And it might happen right away, but it might happen in the future. But even if it doesn't, it's this karma factor yeah. that it's hard to measure, right? But then what happens is you're around about, they say, you know what? This is the person that you ought to talk to and that creates opportunities. You do need to be a little bit patient, right? The law of gestation, it takes a while for certain things to happen. Everything has its own time in which it happens. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, where, where, where salespeople struggle is if you're not making any money right now and you need money, you start coming into the, into the environment with commission breath. Right? Yep. You start coming into it thinking, what's in it for me? And you really just have to get off of that. And the sooner that you can get yourself off of that, even if you're starting out and you, and you do, is just serve the customer. That's the fastest path. Commission breath. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. You've got a lot of great little one-liners in your book, too. It's, 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 really, it's really good stuff. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's just, it's just fascinating to be able to talk about all these different nuances and the, 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 you know, we live in a day and age today now, and I talk a lot about this where things have dramatically changed. Your prospect has dramatically changed the buyers, people that buy anything, the buying process has dramatically changed. Just think about yourself as a buyer of anything. You know, you buy a car, you buy a house, you buy a motorcycle, whatever it is that you go out and purchase, you're a different buyer today than you were even 10 years ago, even five years ago because of, of Google, because of the information age. We have a tendency to know, about, know more about a person's product or service uh, we, we know more about it than a lot of times than the people trying to sell it to us. You know, so by the time you sit down and sit with somebody that's going to give you a presentation, the, the person you're giving a presentation to now, chances are they already know about your product. They already know about your service. They even know uh, what your customers are saying about your products and services. And, uh, and now you're sitting in front of them. So because of that, relationship has become more important in the process than ever before. Do, do you find that 
to be the case? And how do you how do you counsel your clients to be able to be prepared for that? Oh, well, so yeah, there's a ton to dissect in what you just said there. So it's absolutely true what you just said, because in just a couple of seconds, people can go to the internet and get all the information they need. So the role of the salesperson is no longer that of an information dispenser, right? In the olden days, that was the main value that the salesperson brought is the information about the solution. Guess what, guys? They don't need that anymore. They can go online and get all the information about your solution that they need. And like you said, Cody, in some cases, they'll know more than the salesperson knows. So the value that you can bring as a salesperson is in your understanding of what they're trying to accomplish. You're delivering some insight to them about how to accomplish that goal and the best way to do that. So you, we, we're really more consultants today than information dispensers. And I would just add a, one little other thing that kind of adds to what you just said there. And that is um, the customers take this, this sample of time that they are with us and they extrapolate that into what the experience is going to be like to work with the company. In fact, you've got a great story in your book about a company that did this, right? And, and they, they said, all things are being equal. All these solutions seem exactly easier. But, but the way that you followed up with us, with the cards and with, you know, you know, making sure that we had everything we needed, we felt like that was exactly what we were going to get after the sale. And so what's happening there is they are taking a sample of their experiences in the sales process and they're extrapolating that into what their whole experience is going to be like after the sale. And what that means for us as sales professionals is we need to make sure that every sample is awesome. We need to make sure that every sample is, is a hundred percent serving the customer and a hundred percent positive experience for them. And so we don't just wing it. We, we put a little thought into what we want, what kind of experience we want the customer to have when we're with them and even when we're not with them. Right. Yeah. I think the story you're referring to was a construction company that was actually the high bidder on a job. It was a, a dental practice or a, a physician practice that they were remodeling their, their, uh, their offices. And, and this construction company was the highest bid, but the difference was, is that they, every single time, they talked to them on the phone. They sent in a proposal. Uh, they would send a thank you card and a box of brownies or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they, they would do that. And they would make phone calls and text messages to see how they could help and serve with that genuine human connection feel to it all. It was, there's nothing, there was nothing fake. They, they sent a card because they care about those people that they were serving. Mm -hmm. And the way the story ends up, just, just for our listeners, you know the story, but just for our listeners, the way that story ended up is that the, the, uh, the physicians called back this company and said, we're going to hire you. And the company asked, well, how did we do in the bid process? And they said, well, you're actually the highest bid. But here's what's interesting what they said. We're, gonna, we're, we're going to go with you because the way that you followed up with us shows us the way that you will do the job. Now, I hope that sinks in with everybody. The way you followed up with us, the, the way you were so in tune and so in tune to detail and went the extra effort, went the extra mile is indication of how you're going to do the job. So that's why we went with you. And, and I think a lot of times we think that a, a thank you card or uh, a genuine follow-up process is just a nice thing to do. It's a lot more than that. I mean, it sends a message. It does. And I like to say it this way, how you sell is a free sample of how you solve. Nice. Right. right? So they, the customers are looking at the way you're approaching the sales process and they're projecting that. It's just, if your story illustrates it exactly how I mean, it's perfect. They, they see that and they said, that's exactly how I feel like I'm going to get taken care of after the sale. And here's the, the fact. If you look at the kind of companies that actually do pay attention and take care of their customers during the sales process, they are exactly the same kind of companies that take care of their customers after the sales process. That is a fact. That is my experience. When I see companies that are doing it, they're doing it good on both sides. It doesn't happen that all in the sales process, they're really great. And then suddenly when they flip over uh, into the, the delivery part of the uh, solution, that it's horrible. That doesn't happen. And it's a cultural thing, I think. Uh, within the organization. So if you're not doing it, it, you, it should maybe take a minute and introspect about how you are on your delivery side too. 
Well, I'll tell you, James, you got some really good stuff here. Talk, talk to us a little bit about how people can get more access to your content. I know that you got several things out there. Obviously, the book, The Perfect Close. I highly recommend this, by the way, The Perfect Close. And where, where is this available? Where, where can they get this? So Amazon's the best place to get it. Um, and if you're a Kindle reader, you can get it for three bucks. So you can't beat that. Um, you can actually get a download of the first three chapters and literally all of the models. So you can get that, all that for free. So if you want to see if it's for you, you can just go to puremuir.com, P-U-R-E-M-U-I-R.com and just go to the resources right there. And there's like about 20 different resources, including planning forms and the chapters of the book and the models. There's a, there's a report, seven deadly sins of, uh, of sales closing and all that are sitting there. It's all for free just to make sure that it's for you. And then, of course, if you want, you can get the book on Amazon. Um, I think we did something special for your audience as well, Cody, if they want to just watch a video on how to do all this. Yeah, tell, tell us about that. So if they go to, and this is only available here, so you got to either listen to this recording, what I'm about to say, or you got to look at for it in the show notes, right? Because it's not going to be on the website. But if you go to puremuir.com, P-U-R-E-M-U-I-R.com forward slash Cody, K-O-D-Y, then you'll be able to download there at the 20 minute keynote that I did when I was with Cody at the professional business connection summit. Um, and it basically t it goes through the, uh, actually I think we go through four of the five different variations of the perfect close during that. And also we, we talk a little bit about motivation, how to stay motivated in that session. So and that's something all exclusive to your listeners here. I remember when we were both speaking at that, if you remember, there was audio difficulty that, that <laughs> night. Remember? That's right. There was a little bit. There was a little bit. <laughs> I loved how you, uh, how you handled that. We both had to handle it in, in different ways, but it was kind of fun that day. So I always like to close with a couple of questions. Um, it, it just, it, it really, um, I, I love this for our listeners and for me as well. The first one is I, I love to read. My, my biggest, the biggest way for me to nourish my soul is to read. Been that way ever since I was about 14, 15 years old. Uh, so the first question I have is, uh, what is your favorite book of all time and why? Wow. All right. I, I have to give you two. Okay. But, so the easy, uh, the easy uh, answer is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Okay. Absolutely my favorite book of all time. However, and so if you haven't read it, then that's the place to start. Okay. But if you want a minor upgrade to that, then what you get is you get the much bigger Napoleon Hill book, which is called The Law of Success. Mm -hmm. And so the law of success is going to take what's in Think and Grow Rich and it's going to expand on it probably five times, I would say. It's a much, much longer book. But both of them are just fundamentally life-changing, spectacular books. And it's one of the reasons that I just love the whole second half of your book is just nailing all of that um, universal truth that is in Napoleon Hills and all of these other books. And, and you just did a phenomenal job. It was a, a big surprise. I thought it was going to be all about marketing and here are some completely life changing material in the second half of your book. So uh, that's what I would is recommend Napoleon Hill of any kind, but those two books, Think and Grow Rich and the Law of Success were absolutely the best for me. Well, yeah, though, I've got both those books in my library. They're very well marked up and I refer back to them uh, quite often. So yes, I, I would agree with that. Uh, next question. Uh, if you can be remembered for one thing, what would it be? If one thing um, that I used my communication skills and my talents to help people grow themselves and their resources for good. That, that I, honest, I think my honest belief is that good people with resources in this world is a good thing. And so what I want to do is I just want to help people develop themselves and their resources so that they're, so they have, I want good guys to have all of the resources, money, right? So that they can make good things happen. And so I want to teach people how to do that. That's what, if, if, and I'm not done by any means. In fact, I'm not sure that I've really started my major impact. Uh, in the world in that regard but that you're, is you're a young guy you're a young guy james yeah. you, got, you got a lot of you got a lot lot of lot of life left in you brother so you got to keep you got to keep going so yep that's my goal that's my mission right there so hopefully uh, I'll, I'll you know whatever reads on my tombstone it'll be that they that i accomplished that goal that's what i'm at well that's great uh so the what does human connection the words human connection what does that mean to you I think that just speaks to um, 
the intent and the emotion that we feel when we're connected with another person that's authentic and that's genuine. To me, when, when, I, when I hear human connection, what I mean is it's not about a process. It's not about a machine. It's not about automation. It's about one-to-one, -one, you know, human-to-human -human personal connection that where there's caring and understanding going on between two people. So, uh, and I, I, I love the title of your book. Although I'll be honest, I thought that the other titles that you were considering, with me anyway, would have been, they would have resonated with me. So I would have been in the thumbs up for your other possible titles of your book. Yeah, you're referring to, I had, uh, I was originally going to call the book Make Karma Your Niche, which is, uh, <laughs> I know what you're, <laughs> obviously there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of meaning in this book about, in fact, we talk in the book about karma, you know, what you send out in life is what comes back to you. And that's, that's what I love about the perfect close. I mean, think about it. Just, just the question alone, does it make sense to, that's a respectful line. You know, the perfect close has respectful lines in it. Does it, you know, now that we've done this, does it make sense to, uh, shows that respect. You're sending out that respect for somebody. What you send out is what comes back to you. And I think that's a reason, James, that you have been such a success. It was, it was incredible to, to be able to speak on the same stage on the same night with you. Look forward to doing that in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, we have a grand uh, relationship marketing grand summit coming up next August in Salt Lake City, Utah. We expect about 3,000 people in attendance, and I'd love to have you come and be a speaker at that. So we'll get with you uh, for for more detail on that in the near future. So okay, love to support my hometown. So that's an awesome. Right offer. It's yeah, you won't have to travel very far. You just <laughs> drive downtown, and we'll we'll go do a show. So it'd be a lot of fun. So there you have it, everybody. Relationship Marketing with Cody B with my special guest, James Muir. He's the best-selling author of the book, The Perfect Close. I highly recommend that you get out there and get it. Also go to jamesmuir.com forward slash Cody, K-O-D-Y, and get some of those special offers. And uh, let's go out there and keep ourselves educated, keep sharpening the saw, keep doing the good stuff, send out positivity to the world every day. Don't pay attention to the negative clutter that's going on social media and on the news channels. Turn the news off, read a good book, listen to a good podcast, and let's go change the world. Thanks, everybody. Take care now. If you enjoyed this episode of Relationship Marketing with Cody B, be sure to subscribe to the show. Leave a review so that together we can get this message out to the world.